Josh Norris is a football content lead at Underdog Fantasy who previously did work at NBC Sports Roto World. He's the co-host of the Underdog Football Show. He's a fellow JJ. He's got years of prospecting experience and he once completely slayed the NFL combine. These are his late round perspectives. Uh, JJ, this is three years in the making. It really is. It really because we're we're now underdog bros together. Yes, same yes. shirt that we're wearing too. <laughs> Look at this. We are, we're we're matching and everything today. I have my my. I, I've become. I've realized that I've become like uh, not in the way that he is because he's brilliant uh, or he was brilliant. But Steve Jobs, how he would just wear the same outfit every day. Maybe I should say like Doug Funny. Maybe that's probably the the better, more appropriate comp for me. Uh, but I just wear a Dickies tee every day. It's just my good. It's just an easy thing to just grab out of the closet and not have to think about what I look like. And I can just I know that it fits me. OK, I feel good about it. And then I move on. Question. Have you dabbled in the expensive T-shirt market that is like targeted to dudes on Instagram now of like the 40 plus dollar T-shirt? I, I have not. I have yeah. not. I, I'm One very day I I'm think you will, JJ. Yeah, I mean, maybe someday I'll grow up and be and be an actual adult. I, I just never I don't know. I'm not someone who like really buys stuff often, like even even the upgrade of like a fifteen dollars Dickies tea to like a four. Like it's not like that significant of a thing to like purchase. Right. I've just never been like a like like a big purchase for me is like a video game or something. Got it. You know, you know, I was like that my whole life. Too. I saw you before you hopped on. You were tweeting about Wave Race. I saw <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. Donate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm sure yeah, i'm I, sure we all because we're all in the same era you know yeah where you sure. actually had to go and pluck the ticket out of like the the booth at toys r us and take yeah. it to the behind the <laughs> checkout to actually get the game actually you pay for it you know oh, or yeah. there's a line uh to even just try pilot wings or mario 64 or any of yes. these you know yes the glass yes. cases i mean if you can rewind yourself back to that moment was there mm. any greater place in the world than Toys R Us? And was there anything else that you would rather want in the world than to go on one of those Nickelodeon shows and win the prize of you get five minutes to pluck whatever you want of the Toys R Us and fit it into your cart? And that's what you got. And you got to walk out the door. Literally every 12 year old's dream. Yeah. A everyone's. Well and then I also like I'm a very nostalgic person. I love like taking myself back, whether it's through music or whether it's through, uh, you know, video, what have you. And I, I, I love thinking about going into a Toys R Us and knowing that you're going to like purchase a game, yeah. right? Like you, like that feeling the anticipation oh of it. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, one of the most incredible feelings. And, you, and you're going to read the manual and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. You got, you got the Nintendo power that you're going to, that you're going to use with, with the game that you, uh, end up going, what was your favorite is, is wave, wave race can't be your favorite. No, N64 no, 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 no. Okay, I, I will add that I have a brother who's a year older than I am. Got and it. so I watched a lot of video games. Mm, so I, yeah, I was, yeah. you know, the IRL Twitch streamer viewer because right. my brother would get a bunch of single player games and sure. then I would end up watching. I mean, I did gravitate to a lot of, of sports games, a lot of sports yeah. games, but yeah, obviously 64, you could try and fail and do all that stuff and it yeah. was it was just an incredible era yeah 64 i mean you had you had like you could play blitz you could yeah. go play some madden you could there were some bit like slugfest i mean Griffey i Jr. would i even <laughs> remember uh was it 1080 the snowboarding oh, yeah. game 1080 uh, snowboarding yeah <laughs> with with i want to go back and listen to that soundtrack because i feel like i can still remember like Hakate Hayami versus whatever, whatever. <laughs> yeah, and I right. could never do any of the tricks because I wasn't that advanced, right? Right. I right. even remember, God, now we are going deep down. This is, no, this is great. This is I great remember podcast. going to Circuit City at the time, and mm. they even had a little kiosk where you could play the Tony Hawk demo, and that was on mm. PlayStation. I didn't have PlayStation. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. until later on when we sold like 60 in 64 games and then got a PlayStation off of that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> People don't know the struggle. Yes. Right. Um, and I just took from that the Tony Hawk demo disc and just would play that and not the actual <laughs> full nice. game, you know, but felt like nice. it was just like the one hanger that you had that one thing and you, yeah. You did grinds on like the, the helicopter wing and then boom, it went up and so on and yeah. so forth. Propeller. Yeah. Um, 
man, the people will never know. You can just go on like I, Steam now and just download everything and it's on I sale know. at all times. The people will not know. know the struggle and the struggle is the best part of all of it. I know. And now I go to like Target with my daughter who's five and a half and she now will like play with like a VR headset. I'm like, you don't even understand no. what the 64 was like and the graphics that, that came with it. And we thought I, it was amazing back then. I am not telling you how to be a parent because I just am a dog owner at this point. A married sure. dog owner, but just a dog sure. owner at this point. Uh, yeah. And my brother has, you know, I've got two nephews. Yeah. Um, how, what percentage of you, if your child ever gets into video games, wants to force them to start with some of the classics and like have to beat those versus what they really want, which is the new and cool and end stuff. 100%. That's the path that I want my children to go down. Right. So I have a, a daughter who's five and a half. I got a son who's a little over one and the my, my daughter is like she'll play like roblox and like the newer things that are like because her cousins play it and stuff like that and i just i know that she's not going to be a gamer gamer like i know that she's not going to be super super into that but I'm, I'm holding out hope for my son that i can sit down play some super mario brothers 3 which to, to me was like the introduction for me to gaming right. uh and then slowly get into like sonic and then go into n64 a little bit and then let him kind of go see what see what he likes, you know, yeah. kind of go from there. But yeah, I mean, like I want to sit down and game with him for sure. To answer your N64 question from the beginning, I mean, you and I were very in on the perfect dark over Goldeneye. Oh my gosh. I yes. You know? Yes. And so I can for talk, the people I out there, hopefully you, hopefully you can respect this correct opinion that yes. AJ and I have in the minority. Uh if you tried to pick up and physically play both games, you would prefer to play Perfect Dark than you would yes. Goldeneye in 2024. Yes, it's literally the same game, but enhanced and better. It's yes. perfect dark, it, literally. Uh, anyway, we have a show sheet. We have to we have to talk about fantasy football here and, and football in general in this draft. Hope you saw on the show sheet, Josh, that at the top I called you JJ because you are a fellow mm -hmm. JJ as much as you, you know, despise that. But uh, I won't be calling you JJ Norris throughout this this episode. But I'll I'll uh, I'll at least throw that out there that you are a fellow JJ. Well, Let's there's a JJ in this draft class, you know. I mean, there, JJ there, Meter, there, it has to be reshuffled here. <laughs> It is so confusing, so confusing for me to look at the late round fantasy football discord and see people just say like referencing JJ constantly and thinking that they're talking about me, but they're just talking about obviously like Justin Jefferson was tough enough. And now it's this guy who's actually named JJ. Right. Um, but let's talk about prospecting a little bit. You started out at, at Roto World, NBC Sports. Uh, I actually remember this is something I've never told you before. I remember when you got that job and announced it on Twitter. And oh. I was, I had, I, it was about a year before I started doing stuff myself. Right. So I was just a lurker at the time. And I remember having read some of your stuff and having followed you. I like remember sending you like a congratulatory tweet. So you're welcome for that tweet back in 20, what was that? 2011, 2012, somewhere. At some point there. we should try to find that tweet. I've done this with like yeah. Matt Harmon on shows too, but like <laughs> what was our yeah. first interaction together? I yeah. guarantee you it was about Steve Smith. And so I'm sure we have a bunch along <laughs> yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah. I I think mine was on a, a on a previous account, so fortunately no one can see how stupid I was, you know, 15 years ago. This episode is sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. I know a lot of you guys already play over there, but if you don't, you definitely have to check out their best ball drafts. You draft a team, which is honestly the best part of fantasy football, and then that's it. There's no trading, no waiver wire, no lineup setting. Your roster is optimized each week based on player performance. I'm going to be doing a lot of content on best ball this season, so make sure you're signed up and ready to draft for when that content drops. Just head to underdogfantasy.com or download the Underdog Fantasy app. And when you sign up, make sure you use promo code late round to get a deposit match up to $100. That's promo code late round. But how did you get into all this? I mean, you've been doing this for uh, a while. You were at NBC Sports for nine years, been an underdog now for a few. You just, I think, celebrated your third year, correct? At, yep. with, with underdog. Uh, how did you even get into uh, the prospecting world coming out of the great University of Elon? Yes, Elon University, same thing. Yeah, um, right, right. So it honestly starts at Elon, and I'll try to be as brief about this as possible. I've always been obsessed with the NFL draft dating back to the days where it was just Saturday uh, and Sunday. And we would even like in uh, middle school and high school, you know, like there's that big field day that every school has. We called it Big Saturday at Charlotte <laughs> Country Day School. Okay. And it would always fall in the NFL draft. And I just remember 
having to leave that early to go see like Chris Winkie drafted in the fourth round. Or <laughs> we when we got to high school, we would have lacrosse games on that day. And there was one time when I actually had a panic attack because I was missing the NFL draft and had to like breathe into a brown paper bag because I was missing, you know, the first rounds and the second rounds and all this type of stuff. Anyways, wow. so just huge obsession with the NFL draft. Uh, get to Elon uh, going into junior to senior year. Um, I would, you know, every single summer try to get an internship. I had one with Fox Sports Radio out in Los Angeles because I just applied to like this database, right? Mm -hmm. And you just put in your resume and cover letter and you think you're never going to hear from anyone. Uh, that was just like cutting highlights. So like with opening day today, you would, it would be like the person at uh, the top of the hour with like score updates. And then I would just be the person that cuts the, oh, and swings and home run 300 feet deep right center blah 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 anyways yeah, that was yeah. my whole job for two months except um billy devaney was the former general manager of the then st louis rams and he went to elon he was an elon graduate and played football there uh so like the week before school ended everyone at the school got this email of hey this alumni this alum uh is opening up a scouting internship for training camp with the St. Louis Rams to one Elon student. And it was one of those moments, JJ, where you read it and you're like, there is no one on this campus that is more qualified for this than me. You know, <laughs> yeah, I had right. done like student media, that stuff's on YouTube. If you all wanna go watch it, I'm about 40 pounds heavier and stuttering through my words and so <laughs> bad. And I'd done radio for like four years on at, at Elon. That to me is like the huge advantage of, of what Elon gives you is just on hand. Uh, mm -hmm mistake learning so then you're not as awful once you start anyways it all kind of comes full circle there because then spent training camp with the st louis rams that was all the way back in sam bradford's rookie season um wow. the wide receivers were danny amendola yeah um marty gilliard you remember that mm. name? they had mm -hmm. just drafted right yeah because he crushed pitt in, in the big east championship yes, at they, cincinnati yeah yes, they had just drafted marty gilliard he was awful from the start yeah. Roger Saffold was there, Chris Long, James Laurinaitis, so on and so forth. Steve Spagnuolo was the head coach. So go through that training camp. And then they invite me back for the 2011 NFL draft. So I got mm. to sit in the draft room with them wow. for, and that was the first year. It was three days. That mm. was also the lockout year. That was the Cam Newton draft. I mean, just a loaded draft class, yeah, right? Yeah, We're yeah, all, yeah. because there was no free agency ahead of the draft, every team that needed a quarterback took a quarterback. So you got yeah. like the Christian Ponders, the um, Jake Lockers. Yeah, Jake Locker, right? Yeah. Blaine yeah. Gabbert, that group, right? And I learned a ton during that week. Uh, I've shared some on my show. I won't go into all of it, but it was a really enlightening process. And obviously I wanted to, con now, little pin in that uh i had started talking to evan silva just through dms prior mm. to that because evan grew up in st louis was a rams i think supporter at some point and was saying things about what they might or might not do and i was just this college student who would respond to them being like well actually they think this way actually <laughs> yeah. they're leaning in this direction <laughs> and i've already told this story so i'm not never going to get in trouble but when I got to the Rams draft, I go into their draft room with their board and quickly after 20 minutes of somewhat memorizing it, go and like sit in the bathroom floor at the Earth City, Missouri Rams complex and basically text Evan Silva what their draft board is. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> um, and by the way, that oh Rams team was not good, but like Brad Holmes. Mm -hmm. Lions general manager was yeah. like their director of college scouting at the time, basically. Um, Ray Agnew, his right-hand man, was also there. JG, Jonathan Gannon, was just the team's combine scout and obviously now the Arizona Cardinals yeah. head coach. So, like, I run into Brad Holmes at these NFL combine and things, and he's just <laughs> – he, he remembers, which is great. Which That's is awesome. Great. Um, yeah. So – yeah, I mean, from there, did not get a job working with an NFL team. Who knows why, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and, um, but stay in contact with Evan, you know? And so I think that's why you might have seen some of my work at the time, because it was basically freelance. I just worked like the um, yeah. Shrine game and the Senior Bowl, and then I pitched them to turn 
their college football fantasy section into an NFL draft section. Mm -hmm. And that worked out. Uh, and then the man there, Brett Vandermark, who was head of Roto World at the time, yep. um, saw my college reels, saw my on camera work and thought it was OK, because at the time, NBC Sports was opening a new headquarters in Stanford, Connecticut, and they were going to have these digital studios and the digital host was Kay Adams. And so mm. my first year or two, I got to do digital video work and I was so freaking bad, so bad, but it got to work with Kay Adams with all of that yeah. stuff. Um, and then Crazy. it kind of grew from there and obviously morphed into more fancy stuff and then caught up in the NFL draft. Um, but it's kind of been a whole process since then, but like really just the stars aligning for those three or four years. Um, I'm sure we all have stories like that, but it was, uh, it was really cool. It's really cool to look back on. So, so you basically, you got a job at NBC sports because you stole yes. the, the Rams pick. So if you wouldn't have done that, maybe you would have gotten a job with a team and then you would have gone down a completely different career trajectory. Instead, you got stuck with Evan Silva for nine years. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Um, <laughs> the, the second round of that draft was wild because so Josh McDaniels was the offensive coordinator for the Rams during that time. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah. And it was his first year there. He had just failed, I, I guess, in Denver, if I'm not mistaken, and mm -hmm. got that job. Um, they had all these players up on the board, but Josh McDaniels was like, hey, guys, I need two tight ends. And so basically that morning, the entire scouting staff was watching tape of, you remember DJ Williams? I think yeah. he was the tight end out of Arkansas, a smaller guy, yep. versus yep. Lance Kendricks. And that mm. was going to be his new Aaron Hernandez in sure. St. Louis. And the tall guy, the Gronk, was going to be Michael Hoho Manawanui. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so his goal was to recreate Gronk and Aaron Hernandez with yeah. Hoho Manawanui. And then they decided on Lance Kendricks. And by the way, Lance Kendricks was like, 15 or 12 spots down when they got up to the board in like the forties to, to make their next pick. And mm -hmm. Billy Devaney gets up there and says like, guys, we're taking Lance Kendricks because Josh McDaniels just basically walked in and just like folded his arms and didn't say a word. Wow. Um, and so, I mean, at that point it clicked for me like, Oh, when all these teams say that best player available, yada, yada. No, absolutely not. Um, mm -hmm. the team also like needed running backs and that was the Daniel Thomas, Mikel LaShore, Kendall Hunter years, you know, mm -hmm. um, and they also drafted two wide receivers. They drafted Austin Pettis because yeah. when he got up on the whiteboard, uh, he knew like what every wide receiver was supposed to do. And they absolutely love that. He stunk. And they drafted Greg Salas as well. Um, and basically them drafting Greg Salas meant that Dam Danny Amendola was going to leave. And obviously mm -hmm. Danny Amendola went to have a better career than like both of those other guys. Anyways, long, long stuff. But there are so many conversations and, and so many stories and moments of that stuff that uh, while it was just one NFL draft, I'd constantly look back on it and be like, oh, this makes sense. This makes sense. Especially their late round process. Their late round process was like truly horrible, truly horrible. Yeah. But yeah. I'll, 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 I'll stop there. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you walked away from that and you said, hey, if a front office just has a process then they might be able to gain that edge, right? Like I, I always, and, and what's really interesting is that I always talk about how like, like my prospect model, for instance, and I actually talked to, to Hayden about this uh, last week on Twitter, but my prospect model when it comes to draft capital definitely gets more, like the guys who get drafted in the first round and into the second round and, and into the third a little bit, that draft capital weight gets, is, is heavier, if you will, than the late round. I mean, like the, the difference between a, a late fourth round pick and a mid sixth round pick is just not very significant. I think that just plays into sort of what you're saying here is that they're literally throwing darts. Yeah. 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 So when it got to the sixth, seventh round, he basically just went around the room and like figured out which area scout had not had a guy drafted from. Right. Yeah, like their dude. Area. Yeah. And so they're like, hey, who do you want? Or like a position coach who was like, man, I need more players in my room. And they're like, okay, who yeah. do you want? And that was it. That was the process. And so it kind of led me to when I got started working on the draft, figuring out, okay, what would be a better late round process, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of it entailed, you know, athletic testing and finding the dudes who were great testers at certain positions where I think athletic testing really does matter. Yeah. And then cross-checking that with obviously the film and, you know, like the Minnesota Vikings do a great job of that. And it's because I talked with one of their directors of analytics one time at a conference 
And it's because, again, their analytics department pulls the best testers, the 10 best at each position that are going to go in this certain range. And then basically that position coach picks his one or two favorites. And uh, then that gives, you know, the position coach a lot of motivation and excitement of, oh, we this is my guy, like he's going to yeah. be my project and so on and so forth and gives him some ownership of it too. While also the analytics staff having some ownership of that at the same time. So yeah. um, obviously Billy Devaney really appreciate the time, but I think there's also a reason why maybe uh, he has not been a second time general manager. Yeah, right. Exactly. So you, like I said, you started in 2012 and NBC sports full time, yeah. full time. Right. And um, but as it relates to, so, so you've been in like the fantasy football space in that arena for a while, obviously you're doing other scouting. That's not necessarily as fantasy football driven. You know, you're looking at like D tackles and stuff, which we don't care about like right. a ton. Um, but as it relates to fantasy football, what have you seen over the last decade? What have you seen change the most, whether it comes down to the way that fantasy managers manage their teams and look at this stuff or whether it's how analysts like ourselves are looking at this stuff. I think it's a golden age of quality content. Number yeah. one, you know, yeah. growing up, I really wanted to be like, you know, Mel Kuyper or Todd McShay or those types. Right. I think in some ways there might be a younger generation of football content people that want to be like Bill Barnwell or right. even like Billy Bean or Aaron Chats, you know, of yep. it's not just, hey, watch the tape and this is all I see. There's also this whole new wave of information. I think that's a big part of it too that is readily available to the public via PFF or Next Gen Stats or SIS or wherever, right? Um, and I do think that there is a different kind of thirst and hunger to – utilize that information in many different ways and different visuals, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I still think at times, and especially what we hear from like, you know, insiders or NFL coaches, when they do speak, it can still be, oh, it's stats versus film. And we even obviously yeah. have a show that's called that, but man, the, where they meet in the middle, like to me is where it gets so much fun and yeah. where all the answers do lie. You know, yeah. and where there is like debate, but also an understanding of how many potential outcomes there can be. I think that really shows up in this wide receiver class. I'm sure we're going to talk about it. But yeah, I mean, just the quality of content plus Twitter on top of that to share it all, plus YouTube on top of that to share it all, to me is the big difference versus you having to be at ESPN or a television network to get your point yeah. across 10 years ago. Yeah, no, it's a great point. I mean, I, I wouldn't be prospecting probably if not for the data side, right? Like it, it just, to me, it's always been a do what you know you can do and what you're good at, but totally. be open-minded to the things that other people do and that they're good at, right? And so like, I always use this example, but like, you know, with Harmon and in reception perception and last year, my model spitting out Jaden Reed as this like, wow, no one's really talking about him right now. So I'm going to talk about him. And then I go, hey, Harmon, have you charted Jaden Reed? And then he goes and charts Jaden Reed and he's like, wow, he's really, really good. When I get that, I mean, it's a little bit of confirmation bias, but whenever totally. I get that from someone who's pr like going about this in a completely different way, why would I not feel more confident than in touting a guy like Jaden Reed? You know, like I, I think that that side is just as important. It's just that we're approaching this as analysts the best way that we can individually while being open-minded about what other people are generally saying. Yeah. Um, let's look at this class. Let's start with the quarterback position. I do a lot less at quarterback than I do at running back and wide receiver. So I'm definitely curious on your thoughts. JJ McCarthy right now, fellow JJ getting steamed up. Uh, he went from, I feel like in like December, no one was really talking about him at all as even like a, like they were saying maybe like a second rounder, but he's getting steamed up. Uh, right now you're getting, hearing reports about Washington potentially taking him at number two. Um, you know, is there a legit shot that he goes second overall, do you think? And then also, do you think that, you know, number one, is he good? You know, what, what is your general <laughs> view on him there? But also, uh, do you think that he would, or, or could end up being the QB two from a fantasy perspective behind a Caleb, Caleb Williams, assuming that Caleb Williams would be the, the QB one. So a couple of notes here. One, 
I am like no longer in this draft sphere where I have like summer takes that then I get take locked on during the season. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I really do love to pick up on this stuff once the NFL combine hits because I did feel like I used to get like take locked, to be honest, and yeah. Yeah. give excuses this way or the other. And I just love and now that we have all this film to go back on and, and watch and obviously the stats are finished at that point. To me, it's it's easier to paint a clear picture in that way versus previously. It's just easier to do, especially when we have an athletic profile. Like how often, JJ, do you watch someone um, and then think like, oh, he's super athletic and then he tests like an average athlete. And then right. like, you know, I saw this back in the Kendall Wright days where mm. I was saying like, oh, he just had a bad start or the timing's off at the con. Like I I'm not into that excuse making. Anymore. Yes, exactly. Right. Um, right. But to answer your question about JJ McCarthy, he was in an incredible situation. But what I've been able to do is go back and watch really the scenarios that were pure passing situations, like third and five plus third and seven plus, because, you know, that Michigan Harbaugh offense was very much, hey, we're going to be super efficient. Well, not efficient per se, but uh, very successful running the football on first and second down and give us these, you know, winnable situations. And he arguably has the best like third and five plus tape out there on top of that and i think it was maybe dynasty zoltan or someone I'll, I'll send it to you maybe you can put in the show notes who had yeah. like this great great twitter thread about this yesterday of just some jj mccarthy's statistics and underlying numbers like only 38 percent of his attempts were in the second half of the season 14 percent were in the fourth quarter average halftime lead was 11 points. You know, it's like all these situational things that you talk about that, oh, this is conducive to a really successful quarterback play. And so when things go poorly or he does go into a worse situation, um, how is he going to, is he going to be able to like lift his teammates in those moments? A la like we talk about with Caleb Williams or we talk right. about with Drake May or we talk about Jaden Daniels who also had a fantastic situation. But where he differs from a lot of those guys is honestly where the NFL is in terms of creating super explosive plays right now. It's that under center, deep play action and attacking over the middle of the field. And mm -hmm. I thought he did that at a really, really successful level. And again, this age conversation is even more prominent now than it ever has been before. And this really shows up to me when we talk about Drake May, but he's what, 20, 21 years old. Right. And we're also having to compare them to guys who have played five or six years of college football. And so even the mental plus physical development of it all is something that I think now is more important, but also more difficult to gauge whenever. Yeah. The, the age thing is, is incredibly important. I think for a lot of prospects across every position this season, at least the fantasy positions, because, you know, we'll get to them in a second, but like Aroma Dunze, for instance, who played the full four years in college, but then he enters the NFL a little bit younger Right. Uh, you know, that then some of the, the then a typical four year wide receiver would. But there's there's the, like the, the 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 thing that we always have to remember is that like you can't give a Jaden Daniels type the benefit of the doubt because he was a from a statistical perspective because he was able to play those extra years and then discount J.J. McCarthy because we have no idea what would happen over the next two or three years of his collegiate career. Totally. That really pops up for me with Drake May because. You can talk about him spraying passes or being inaccurate here or there, or making some bad decisions, so on and so forth. But like, if you just look at his first year as a starter, it's better than any Jaden Daniels season, except for this past one that we saw, which is his right. like fourth or fifth year as a starter. Same with Bo Nix, same with Michael Penix, you know? Right. And so right. like, just imagine in college football, if he was able to play for three more years and then you would have a different time to compare it to. Question for you, because obviously COVID plus NIL is... Yes allowing people to transfer, um, be much older than before. H how much previously had you factored in age into draft models? Because I know in the dynasty community, it's been a big thing, breakout age for a very long time, or just age when entering the draft. And have you changed that? Have you been forced to change that really this year? Because I think it's this year is more pronounced than ever before. It 100% is. If you look at the number of running backs, especially that are 24 years old entering the... Like they're, like, they're from Purdue? Like, yeah, I, like yeah, I like the guy from Purdue, but he's he's yeah. like 26. Right, right. Ray Davis is over 24. You have uh, Dylan Lauby coming out of New Hampshire, who's over 24. And like we have like a handful of them. I can't remember the exact number. There's like six or seven of them. Since 2011, we had like nine in total. Right. right? And so you have to look at that and, and understand that we're in sort of a different era. Now, 
Do I think that it is going to continue down this path to this degree? I think that COVID had something to do with what we're seeing today in 2024, right? I do think NIL is going to have an impact to some degree then in 2025, 2026, and so on. But I think the COVID effect is going to be lessened, you know, as we go on because it's going to be, we're going to be like eight years removed at some point. So what I'll say is I actually, uh, you know, breakout age, for instance, I threw away breakout age out of my model this past year because I, there's a lot of flaws, I think, to it. It's really binary, hate the binary nature of it where it's like this guy broke out, this guy didn't. And if the guy didn't, but he had like, you know, a decent stat line. He looked, he's looked at as the exact same as a guy who caught three passes, which to me just doesn't make any sense. Right. So I created, I created a breakout score for running backs and wide receivers, which looks at different thresholds and, and uh, it looks at uh, yards per team pass attempt for wide receivers and total yards per team play for running backs. And it just says, okay, you were this age when you hit this threshold and there's a ton of different thresholds in it. Right. So it's not just, you know, did you hit what, whether you use a 20% dominator or a 30% dominator, did you hit that mark? Yes or no. This is a, a much more like, you know, gray area, uh, non, non-binary way of sort of looking at breakouts. So from that standpoint, you know, I can look at a guy like Roma Dunze or someone right. or, or someone who played for four years and say, okay, well, well, this is going to properly wait when those good numbers really hit instead of just saying, did he hit this one standard line during the season? Um, and then kind of go from there. We'll talk about him a little bit later. I think Xavier Leggett is the most interesting. It's of fascinating. That. Yeah, right. It's one of the craziest profiles I've ever seen. But he's like the perfect example of that where um, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, uh, you know, once we get to wider. I even remember this being like a conversation just a couple years ago with like Chris Olave. You yes, know? it was ridiculous. But but here's the thing, Josh, the problem and I, I've ranted about this on my show before. The problem with it is not so much that some of these metrics it's not that these metrics don't get any signal, right? It's, it's that just the binary nature of it. Yes. And it's when people actually go to utilize these metrics, right? Like, like they are out, people are going to be out there fading or they did fade Chris Olave simply right. because he went to school that extra year right. where Olave's num best numbers didn't even come from that final season. It was irrelevant. Like it didn't even matter to his overall profile. He had his own reasons to go back to school. And I think we're, we're going to run into a similar situation with Roma Dunze to some degree here in 2024. And I, th there might be an added layer on top of that now. Cause I remember back when I, you know, was working the NFL draft section of, of Roto world, where if you transferred, you had to set out a year, you know, right. And right. now, um, with NIL, you could like Adonai Mitchell, for example, like you can transfer play immediately and get paid to transfer in ways. And I don't know if that was his situation, but like sure. now we, it used to previously be basically one reason why a, a prospect transferred and now, and then plus he had to set out a year unless it was, you know, a graduate degree, but now you can transfer for whatever reason mm -hmm. and get playing time on top of that and be out there on the field. And it's just to me, even that process um, and who knows how long you stay there or so on and so forth. It, I'm, I'm so glad you said that you've, you've kind of changed how your, your model approaches this stuff, because I don't even have a good grasp of where college football is at, at this moment. Exactly. And, right. uh, I don't know if I ever will, cause I'm, I honestly do not watch college football on Saturdays anymore. I just catch right. up through it from February and on, but it, it creates so many more fascinating situations and how we kind of utilize the data and even just our eyes is to compare it across decades or previous draft classes or previous players. And because of that different story arc or career arc, these guys are having in college football. Now that becomes even, I think more difficult to, like you said, be binary about it. Yeah. And the other problem that we're going to run into, I think, and this is not something that I've really like fixed or adjusted for in the model. Cause I don't know how you necessarily would. Um, but when a guy transfers, I, I do think that we have to inject a little subjectivity when it comes to the analytics uh, about that player getting acclimated to that new offense, right? Yeah. Like, I, I don't think it's nothing, you know, when, when uh, just think about like, like yourself, if you were to transfer a, a co in college and go somewhere else, like there's an adjustment period for you, right? It'd be no different than what would happen for a college student going from a one program to the next. And so, you know, you look at someone like Keon Coleman, you look at someone like Adonai Mitchell and you're like, okay, their numbers are definitely not totally there, but then you have to at least like, you know, take a step back, not be just like, this slave to these numbers and right. take a step back and say, Hey, 
I wonder if these numbers look the way that they do because these guys went through a pretty big life change. Yeah, and I think the other aspect is, and I, again, I don't know how an NIL works at every single school, but maybe prospects coming out of high school are more likely to kind of go to these bigger programs, right? And then if it doesn't work out from a playing standpoint or a coach yeah. leads or so on and so forth, now they don't have to wait that extra season to transfer. Mm -hmm. They can just transfer out. And so like, again, breakout age is easier to do at Kent State than it might be yes. at Michigan State, you know? Yes. And is, yes. then when you get to your final season, that's the one time you finally got in the field and then you produce after, yeah. you know, not having to have the penalty that people in the last decade previously did for making that first decision and then trying to transfer schools. Yep. That's why with breakout score, I, I adjust for program too now, which I didn't do before when like breakout age doesn't adjust for program. Like, right. like, like Sky Moore broke out because he played at Western <laughs> right. Michigan as a freshman. Hey, and I talk about and, this all the time, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to like what I, one of the biggest learnings for me was this, this, this off season while I was sort of adjusting the model and fixing things and coming up with breakout score was just the, the idea that like, I, I think the biggest flaw with the numbers driven community and in, in fantasy is that they look at all of these situations as totally apples to apples. You know, like there's a reason that Javon Baker went from Alabama to UCF and he was able to finally have like monster seasons at UCF where he wasn't able to do that at Alabama because number one is Alabama, but also he's comp competing with Jameson Williams and Devonte Smith and these really good wide receivers, right? Like, it's fine to give that stuff context instead of just saying, oh, this guy broke out when he was 18. It's like, okay, well, he played at freaking Dartmouth or something, you know, just some right. random collegiate school. You could find great breakout scores for D3 players constantly. It doesn't mean that they're going to be good NFL players. Yeah, and you're so much better at interpreting all this stuff than I am. I'm constantly learning with it and trying to incorporate it. But to me, it's almost, hey, let's give praise to the people who did break out at 18 and 19, yes, but exactly. not necessarily take it away from the people yes. who took them to 21 or 22 years of age when they finally did get their opportunity and then they maximize it. Yes. And we'll get to the Leggett thing because that is easily. So, so we'll, yeah, I don't we'll think I have any answer on that one, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I think it's really interesting because there's some really interesting data on it as totally. well. Let's just wrap up the quarterback stuff. Yeah. Sorry about with, that. With, with, us. No, it's a, it was a really good conversation. Uh, this is why I have late round perspectives to begin with. I just want us to kind of just, it, it, it's, it's sort of, I had Sigmund Bloom as the first guest of late round perspectives. Three hours. Because, yeah. You know, it, was, it was just, just the hour, but uh, you know, it's like on the couch is sort of the vibe, right? It's just like, let's just hang out and just literally talk about anything that's on the top of our dome right now and just go from there. But let's just talk about Jaden Daniels. I do still have a show sheet. Uh, Jaden Daniels, obviously has, I mean, speaking of long collegiate careers and the breakout coming late, uh, that's Jaden Daniels, right? right? But then he also had two really, really good wide receiver prospects on his team. But then on the other hand, and then he has this, the the, the big pressure to to sack rate that everyone's been talking about this offseason as like the new big thing with quarterbacks. There's just a lot of stuff going on with Jaden Daniels. So I got to ask you, where are you at with him? And then where you're at with him, does that align with where you're at with him? Like on a fantasy from, the, from a fantasy perspective? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of this fantasy stuff really does matter about team fit, you know, and where they go. Like if Drake may goes to the Patriots versus the Minnesota Vikings, like that situation is yeah. wildly different to me, right. you know, in right. terms of surrounding talent, in terms of offensive play caller, in terms of offensive line, so on and so forth. So it's like the same player in both, but like, Hey, things can be more effective and efficient with one versus the other. When it comes to Jaden Daniels, yeah, the obviously the counting stats are unbelievable. And he was in a great situation, but guess what? He maximized it. Like that might be underselling yeah. it at some point, you know? It was right. unbelievable. What, 3,800 passing yards, 1,100 rushing yards, 50 total touchdowns and four interceptions. Not bad. <laughs> yeah, um, pretty good season. But like the underlying metrics give you concern and maybe questions of, hey, it's not as clean as the raw stats might point to, you know, mm -hmm. you talked about the the pressure rate and how it's, you know, above that 20% mark and even higher than that. And like most of the quarterbacks, I think other than Joe Burrow at that point are kind of like failed or failing right. in right. that area. But it goes even beyond that. Um, Nate Tice had a great article on Yahoo about this 14.1% scramble rate ranks third among 196 qualifying quarterbacks since 2019. So basically he's scrambling, what, 14% of the time. Malik Willis is like the only other NFL prospect that's near him in that yeah. area. Um, 
there are some more like 17% of his throws beyond the line of scrimmage were over the middle of the field in the last two seasons. I really equate his LSU offense, JJ, to the Philadelphia Eagles. When mm. you had, obviously, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and they can be interchangeable and sometimes, sometimes be used in the slot, but mostly outside wide receivers, right? Yeah. And so, hey, if it's single high stuff, or especially in college where the hash marks are so wide that the field side – has so much space that we can kind of turn it into one-on-ones, even if it is too high shell yeah. stuff. Yeah. That, oh, I've got these two alphas on the outside, and we can throw, I mean, I think Malik Neighbors, like 63% or Brian Thomas, 63% of their targets last year were either goes or hitches. So it's just like mm. everything on that plane, right? And because of that, you rarely had to do anything over the middle of the field. But then when his first read was not open, like how does he handle those pressure situations? And some of those scrambles are insane, right? But just 50.6% of his pressure dropbacks resulted in a pass attempt that also ranked 193rd out of 196. So it either equaled a sack or a scramble on 50% of the time that he was pressured. How often do you see that? type of game at the NFL level, I think is, right. is the thing here. And so right. typically you want like those small confined movements in a closing pocket to find like the little piece of space to hit that second or third read. Um, and I just don't know if I saw that enough to be as confident as some other people that he is like the locked in quarterback too in this class. I think the one thing from a game theory perspective, and interestingly, I did an episode earlier this week on sort of how quarterbacks appreciate and value from a dynasty perspective, and it's wild how well they appreciate. Yeah, value. That's why I'm trying to trade for one of yours in our dynasty league. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I do have I do have like six starters in that. Well, you league. have more than that. You think you have like twelve <laughs> yeah. quarterbacks in your roster? Yeah, Last, I, know. I just I mean, went for value. You, you yeah. are so much. We need to tell the people about this. You are so <laughs> invested in last year's quarterback class. You have all three of them. You have I do all have three all of three. them. You have CJ Stroud, Anthony Richardson, and Bryce Young. We can only start two. You also have Brock Purdy. You have all these other dudes. And it's yeah. just, I think, pinpointed at me. So I sell you the farm or give you yeah. the farm in order to try to get one of these guys. It's coming. It's coming. Look, I took over a team. It was an orphan. Took it over and I had to rebuild. So I'm just gobbling up as much value as possible. I had a ton of picks last year and people were laughing very hard at the rookie draft because I had three like top six picks or something like that. And I ended up just getting three, all three of the quarterbacks last year. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's amazing how well they appreciate in value. Like Bryce young hasn't appreciated in value. He's more of the exception to the rule, but uh, like Zach Wilson from year one to year two, he actually saw an increase in startup ADP despite, right. you know, not showing us much Justin Fields, who I think from like a game theory perspective, like if you look at, you know, obviously the mobility and stuff with Jaden Daniels and, and whatnot. Uh, but but I, I think with Jaden Daniels, like if if he, if he has a bad rookie season, yeah, it would probably be like a Justin Fields rookie season. Right. Like like from like a production standpoint and sort of how things came together. Justin Fields saw a drop of nine spots in startup ADP from year one to year two. And so my thing is, yes, I agree. Like, I think there's a lot of volatility to Jaden Daniels profile overall. I talked about that on the show. But I think that what's interesting is that you can probably still confidently invest in him from a from a dynasty perspective, just because chances are he's going to be starting wherever right. he goes. He's going to be a top five pick probably. And then if he starts, we know the mobility aspect is going to be there. We know he's probably going to put up some fantasy points. Right. If he puts up some fantasy points, then that stability from, from a value perspective is going to be there year over year. But then you get like a one year look to see like, well, what if this does transfer? What if he does find the right coordinator that can un unleash him and unlock him? Because we've seen that happen in college, right? And yeah. so like, it's sort of this like no downside situation unless he's just dreadfully terrible. But I think the- But the he's actually not like, he's super accurate, you know? Like right, 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 motion right. over and over again. So like maybe some areas that could be fatal flaws for someone else, to me, that's not the issue for him. That's for sure. Like what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. So I think that that there's- it's 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 one of those things where just it's important to sort of separate the 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 difference between, you know, a Drake May or JJ McCarthy potentially being a better real quarterback right. and then understanding that maybe after year 1 you just reevaluate and you maybe force yourself out of a situation with if you have Jaden Daniels on your roster, but uh or or you can just ride it and, and see what, see what happens. Just a couple more notes about his game. Uh I got to break down one of his games start to finish with Colt McCoy and like one thing that we noticed was like there was a third and eight. He takes off for a nine yard run 
So it's a first down, so it's a positive play. But the exact same time he chooses to take off, there's like this 20-yard in-cutting route that he kind of turns down instead that could have gone for 32 yeah. or 35. So again, it's a positive play, but it's not like the best result. Right. I will say in that same game, a very similar concept, he does sit in there and hit that dig cut, does hit that in-cutting route. Uh, there were similar things said about Anthony Richardson last year, where like in the same game, you could see him learning on the fly, mm. missing a read in the second quarter, but hitting it at the end of the third. I will say Anthony Richardson had basically played like nine games and <laughs> Jane Daniels is in his like fourth or, you know, whatever. His 90th game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there was a bit of a difference in terms of how many opportunities and reps they had at the thing. Um, I don't know, man. I'm, I'd be curious what the comment you just made about changing in startup ADP where it is with Anthony Richardson, because in some ways, everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong last year, where like he gets yeah. knocked out of two or three games, misses the entire season. But man, I'm obsessed with Anthony Richardson. I think he's going to yeah. be a star in the league. Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. I mean, and his value hasn't changed. If anything, I think exactly. it's, it's increased. Right. And so it's just one of those things where like, we know that quarterbacks have a lot of value in super flex leagues just naturally. And so um, I, you know, I think the, the reason that I, that the, the, the two reasons that I came up with as to why this fascination exists and this thing exists is because number one, teams that invest in quarterbacks is we're talking about higher end quarterbacks only. Like we're not going to talk about this with like an Aiden O'Connell or something like that. Right, and right. so, um, you know, the teams, teams are going to invest in these guys. And when they invest in these guys, they're not going to give up on them after one year. They, they do do that at times with some wide receivers or maybe maybe running back not so much but we've seen it with wide receivers and wide receivers have to win on their own and more independently than what a, a running back would have to um so it's it's this investment but it's also just the demand right from a from a from a fantasy manager standpoint they're like man i gotta get a starting quarterback who has upside because who knows what's going to happen and so i think it's more so like really figuring out what happens after year one with these guys uh because i do think they're relatively safe investments at least you know, entering year one. You know, I, I did this in another dynasty league and it's only single quarterback, but it has 14 teams where for like multiple years, I took the quarterback that draft Twitter hated because he kept falling over, oh, yeah, and, over yeah, and over again. Yeah. And so I have like Justin Herbert, I have Daniel Jones, <laughs> Josh Allen. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've got guys because guess what? Quarterback evaluation is difficult, you know? Yeah, like exactly. We stink at it. NFL stinks at it. You know, it's just yes. the name of the game. Uh, there's so many factors that go into it. So um, I'm totally with you uh, that the investment in that spot, unless they are, I mean, the point about Zach Wilson and how it barely changed, like that is. Yeah, Kenny Pickett's barely changed. Yeah, I mean, that that is the biggest tell of, of it all <laughs> yeah. because those guys stink bigly. Yeah, and, and look, Bryce Young is still a fifth, sixth round startup pick. Like he's not, it's not like he like completely lost all value. And I think that, you know, there are reasons to still maybe invest if you're into like the new coaching staff there and stuff, but we'll, we won't go I'll into that. I'll trade you a second round well, pick for Bryce Young. There yeah. we go. Well, here, we're, we're going we're gonna to do a deal <laughs> live on air. Let's move on to wide receiver. audience would love that anyway. Let's so. move, actually, they probably would. <laughs> Let's move on to wide receiver. Um, I'm just going to ask you the question that everyone would probably ask. We have Marvin Harrison Jr. We have Malik Neighbors as probably the consensus top two in yeah. general. But but Roma Dunze is lurking. He's there. And Matt Harmon drops reception perception this past week where a Dunze has only green on his chart. He's looking like an unbelievable route runner with Harmon's process. And, and I think that honestly, I mean, I think that Harmon really got a lot of people riled up slash excited about a Dunze. So how are you viewing the three of them? Do you have a clear one, two, three? Do you think that they are in one tier altogether? Or do you think yeah. that it is Harrison neighbors and then a Dunze? And any given year, any of these dudes could have been the number one ranked wide receiver. I mean, we could look yeah. to last year's class, you know, yep. and any of these guys would have been a top easily. five, top 10 pick easily. Yep. Right. So yep. in some ways it's the luck of the draw of which draft class you are in, you know, uh, in comparison to being wide receiver three or wide receiver one, so on and so forth. I mean, all three kind of play the game differently. I would say like Marvin Harrison Jr. and, and Roma Dunze might play it the most similarly compared to Malik Neighbors. Um, what's fascinating, and like I'm sure you've seen this, the continuous buzz from Daniel Jeremiah or Dane Brugler or Lance Zerline, and now we're getting Schefter and so on and so forth, mentioning like, oh, Malik Neighbors could be multiple teams wide receivers once i mean 
I totally could buy it, you know? Right. I think we see a small microcosm of this in terms of fantasy football when you fall in love with certain traits or certain aspects of a profile. I will say there are multiple different ways of creating 15 plus yard gains, explosive plays mm -hmm. in the NFL. And while the super flashy yards after catch pulling away from people stuff is awesome, it really is. And Malik Neighbors is awesome at that. Right. Um, so is route running, being pinned along the sideline, creating a sliver of separation, yeah. going up and getting it. Because like over the last two years, I think Marvin Harrison Jr. has 68 gains of 15 plus yards and Malik Neighbors has 66, you know? Mm -hmm. So like they are neck and neck in terms of those effective plays. Both their games translate. Um, it kind of just depends on which one you like. And on top of it, Romo Dunze is a freaking awesome prospect. Like how often do we, like take for example, Gabe Davis just got the bag in NFL for yeah. agency, right? <laughs> right? How right. frustrating is it to watch and invest in Gabriel Davis on a annual basis, on a weekly basis, even figuring him into your lineup, you know? And I think you and I have learned over the last few years, he's basically been the same exact player throughout that time. <laughs> <laughs> it's yes. just us interpreting it incorrectly. But yes. the reason he got the bag is because he's an outside X wide receiver that you just line up on the line of scrimmage and ask him to do the dirty work down the field. Um, that's the role that Romo Dunze is going to do. He's just exponentially better at it. Right, so, right. you know, when he does get contact, man, he, his second or third movements to create that sliver of space and create that separation is just leaps and bounds ahead of someone like Gabriel Davis. So again, they might do different things and play different roles and one be put in fly and, you know, jet motions like Malik Neighbors and work over the middle of field or be pinned along the sideline. But all three are are just stellar, stellar prospects. That's a cop out, but like I'm just trying to put no. it into my brain. No, I think it's totally fair. I mean, I I, I have Harris, I have it ranked Harrison neighbors, and then I do have a teardrop to Adunze only because the way that the model is seeing things right now, right? And I, I just and quickly on that, I would put the three together at the top, yeah, but only because I think the next wide receiver is that steep of a yeah, drop I agree with that, yeah. That. Yeah, yeah, I I definitely can can understand that for sure. Um, you know, the the Marvin Harrison thing, you know, so technically Malik Neighbors looks very, very slightly better in the mall. Like he has a 99.5 score. Marvin Harrison is a 99.3 score. Okay, pre pre-draft. And I ranked Harrison above neighbors. And people are like, why are you doing that? And the reason I did it is because we've seen Marvin Harrison now in multiple offenses with multiple quarterbacks just ball out, right? right. The the neighbors thing was last year N neighbors 2023 is better than I think any other wide receiver season in this class. But I do think that uh, at least analytically, but I, but I, I do think that, you know, there's a lot more safety in a guy like Harrison, just because we've seen the change of scenery, the change of circumstance, and we can feel a little bit more confident, you know, in that as a result. Yeah. And I, I love that interpretation of the numbers. Like you're not just sticking to exactly what the numbers tell yeah, you. Yeah, of course not. Like yeah. you are obviously interpreting and trying to put it into the context of different systems, different quarterbacks, like going from CJ Stroud to, is it Kyle McCord? Is that his name? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, like huge difference, huge yeah. difference. You know, like his quarterback didn't win the Heisman this year. His quarterback is not going to be a top five selection. So right. yeah, I mean, putting context to what, what the model spits out is, is the name of the game. Right. I just, I tell people all the time, I use it as a guide so that I'm not doing anything stupid, you right. know, because it's, it's really but, easy. But we still do stupid stuff despite that. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. I'm still going to do some stupid things. And it's, it's really mostly, I think, you know, with the model stuff, it's really mostly like spotting some late round guys and spotting right. values and stuff. Because like, like I said, draft capital is going to get more weight early on. I'm not going to stray away that, that dramatic. There's some guys that I probably will, but the, you know, it's not going to be this like, you're looking at my rankings versus draft capital of the first like round and a half. And you're like, wow, these are totally different. No, there's going to be a pretty strong alignment where things really need to differ is when you get into the later rounds, because that's where things differ with the NFL in the way that they're approaching these guys. Question. How much then does situation they landed in matter with that? Because like draft capital, like what we saw last year, three wide receivers going back to back to back, their draft capital yeah. is all the same, you know? Right. right. And like, at what point does the situation they went into, the reliance of needing this type, the coaching staff, sure. how good sure. the team is factor into that as well? Not as much as it used to for me because okay. I've just experienced what I've experienced in players falling to the right spots and us 
being a little bit arrogant yeah. in yeah. the way that we think that they fit and then teams kind of seeing them in a completely different light and using them a completely different way. Um, you know, whether it's like guys who played 90% slot in college and then they're perimeter receivers or, or what have you, you know, so there's some of that going on. Um, I think it matters though. Like I, I think that the, the landing spot thing is number one, really difficult to quantify. And yeah. so it's not something that I input into the model. Um, but, but also, you know, the landing spot stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you are evaluating talent first and foremost, and talent is going to create that opportunity. And so if I have a tiebreaker, you know, if it is, you know, you mentioned the guys last year going back to back to back. If I had my updated model from last year, this year would have been easily, I would have been easily, easily able to rank. It would have gone JSN, uh, would have gone uh, Addison, Zay, and then Quentin Johnson was looks horrible in yeah. this new iteration, right? So it would have been probably pretty easy because I, I also think that landing spot plays a role there. And JSN, it just likes it just like JSN, like it was it's probably a miss, just liked him, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, like I, I think it's fine to use it as some sort of tiebreaker. The thing that we have to remember is that like how a player gets off to the start of his career is very very important to his overall value right and so if he is in a spot where we know that he has an opportunity to immediately produce and then you can reevaluate how that player is and how his fit is in the offense and stuff like that after year one that's still a win for you damian pierce is a great example of that damian pierce falls to a completely open backfield yeah completely open backfield in houston and obviously what happened last year happened with this completely new scheme which you know i think that no one saw that coming to that degree i don't think um but at the same time you know there you can look back and be like oh yeah okay there are some signs that this might have gone down the way that it went down but regardless people were drafting damian pierce yeah he was a decent prospect but people were drafting him mostly or partially at least because he fell to a backfield in houston where he was the dude they, like he was going to be potentially the guy there's not a lot of competition and so you could hypothetically have flipped that you know after year one so i do think that you should still pay attention to landing spot. It's still, right. it still definitely should be a factor. Yeah. I kind of wonder if wide receiver landing spot is more important than running back landing spot because like the I quarterback think. you're attached to, but obviously quarterback things can change right. every single like year. Drake, like Drake London, but like, but yeah, like Drake, but Drake London is a great example, totally. right? Where, where if they didn't make the investment in Kirk cousins, I think you and I would sit, sit here and say, Drake London is probably like a top 15, at least talent at wide receiver in the league right now. Like yeah. he's, he's up there. He's and awesome. so, yeah. And so like, like, you know, we're, we're sitting here and we're like, just give him a good quarterback, but that also could have just tanked his dynasty value and we could do nothing about it. You know, I, I get in, like, it, it goes both ways. Like I get in trouble sometimes for weighing landing spot too much, whether yeah. it's redraft or dynasty. And then I get in trouble. Like last year I was drafting Drake London in redraft because I'm oh, like, oh, he's dude. good. You know, like I'm like, he's, I just think he's a good player and I want to invest in good players. I think I generally lean that way more. You know, when the when the model's saying something, when my eyes are saying something, when other people are saying stuff, uh, I'll lean that way more. But, you know, I, I think landing spot, Matt, like Devon Achan is not Devon Achan outside of Miami. Puka Nakua <laughs> is not Puka Nakua outside of totally. LA. And we got to be okay with that. Like, we got to yeah. be cool with that because I do think that it, it does matter. Yeah, it's, um, th th just quickly, this yeah. is what makes this all so fun. Because if there was an answer for all of us to follow the same exact checklist, yes. then this game would be boring, you know? Yes, so, yes. Figuring out what matters when with who, like that is the entire name of the game and why yes. no one's going to get 100% correct or 80% correct or, you know, 75% correct. I think that it's, it's, maybe I'll put it this way. I think the landing spot stuff is when there's like a very glaringly obvious good or bad fit. Yeah. Right. Like, like, like Devon Achan, like pre-draft, <laughs> I was like, okay, I don't know for sure. Like he's smaller. Like, you know, there's all these, this data that suggests that this like he was okay. He was because his production profile was like out of control in college. So like right. it was it's not like the model didn't like him. But uh, you know the size thing was a, a question mark. But then he got drafted by Miami, and even in my prospect guide last year, I'm like, yes, like go like draft him. You know, like this is this is quite literally the best landing spot for a player like Devon Achan, right? Right. And so I, I do think that you can go that hard in that direction when you know the landing spot is that good, as opposed to. You know, I think it's kind of lazy to just say, oh, this wide receiver has Patrick Mahomes, therefore draft him. Right, right. You know, I think there um, needs to be a good scheme fit. Yeah, and I think coaching, obviously, like you talked about the McDaniel, makes sense. Like with Andy Reid, for example. Rasheed Rice literally ran 
or had yeah. like five big boy targets last year. Yeah, you know, right, like, right. like right. it doesn't Tom matter. Though. Right. Like literally, that that is it. That is not an exaggeration. <laughs> right. And still, he's being put in a where he wins scenario, and it's totally working out for him. Final question on this: um, For years, years, I've gone back and watched every single post draft press conference of all of these NFL teams Love after it. the NFL draft. Do you think like that is pointless? No. Okay. I don't think so. I don't think it's totally pointless. I, I mean, I, I don't have a, any sort of process or have tested anything related right. to it, but I think if you are able to consume information and not be weighed and swayed so dramatically by that single piece of information, uh, you know, I, I do think that it, it, the information can be helpful, yeah. right? It's just and a if, matter I, of I, like, I think almost inevitably it's going to help and it's going to hurt. And it's like, help in certain ways and then hurt with others like you'll like last year picked up that the bills want to be 11 and a half personnel you know and then yeah. all this stuff gets recycled and so yeah they ran that a ton early on but then it was super unsuccessful you know so right. like you can be right in the usage but then wrong with how it turns into you know or, right. or, the, or the, the production that comes from it Right. But, but the question would be for me, was it logical, right? right? Is it logical to think the way that you're thinking about that thing? And if it is, then sure. Right. But if it's not like, if you're talking about, you know, a running back, that's going to be catching a lot of passes or something, or like the team steaming him up for that, but like the math doesn't really work out that way. Or like, I think right now, like Josh Jacobs is a really interesting example of that with, yeah. uh, with green Bay, where they're going to come out and say, Oh, he's a bell cow. He's going to catch a ton of passes, yada, yada, yada. I think he's capable of catching a lot of passes. But at the same time, if you look at Matt LaFleur's history, dating back to even Tennessee, where right. he's splitting a backfield with Deion Lewis and Derek freaking Henry uh, and, and how they used Aaron Jones throughout his time there, who Aaron Jones to me is the superior pass catcher compared to Josh Jacobs. And it's right. like, why would we necessarily logically make that connection and think that Josh Jacobs would be so dramatically better than what Aaron Jones was, right? So like, I think it's just that, like matching it all up. Whereas if they're like, yeah, Devon A. Chan's going to Miami. He's going to play in this zone zone scheme. Like, yeah, like let's go. You know, like this, like he's going to destroy there. So I think it's just a matter of of how logical you know you can approach those those topics. Thank you uh, for for indulging my tangents. I yeah, I, I, dude, this is this is great. This episode is sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. I know a lot of you guys already play over there, but if you don't, you definitely have to check out their best ball drafts. You draft a team, which is honestly the best part of fantasy football, and then that's it. There's no trading, no waiver wire, no lineup setting. Your roster is optimized each week based on player performance. I'm going to be doing a lot of content on best ball this season, so make sure you're signed up and ready to draft for when that content drops. Just head to underdogfantasy.com or download the Underdog Fantasy app. And when you sign up, make sure you use promo code late round to get a deposit match up to $100. That's promo code late round. You mentioned that after a Dunze, there was a gap you yeah. saw from a tier perspective is Brian Thomas, your wide receiver four uh, is do, what are your issues with him as to why he would? Cause it sounds like he's pretty firmly the wide receiver four from like a projected draft capital standpoint, right? Yeah. Like if you look at NFL mock draft database right now, like he's firmly in the top 20 at this point. Right. And so, you know, he's very, he's a really weird about for me because his numbers look really good in the model but he was very, very difficult to find matches for from a from a comp standpoint. And that scares me a little bit. Like his top comp was actually Quentin Johnston, which is frightening. Um, did Brashad Perryman pop up in any? No, but Brashad Perryman did pop up for Keon Coleman. Got it. Yeah. I think uh, Brian Thomas, like one potential outcome could be Brashad Perryman. Here. I think there's a high, high range of outcomes for Brian Thomas. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what, what are you seeing with him? Like, what, what do you see with his game? Yeah, I really struggle. Hayden is like all in. We're going to record actually. So right now on the Underdog NFL Draft channel, um, we are going through and doing like nine to 15 minute prospect profiles on like all these guys. Mm -hmm. And Hayden and I never share notes ahead of time. Uh, frequently, as you know, frequently we come to the same conclusions beforehand yeah, of course. Yeah. because we somewhat look at the we do shows like seven times a week together like yeah, we, yeah. we kind of consume the same tape and the same you know statistical information anyways um he, i can tell he loves brian thomas jr i never want to throw a six foot 200 pound six foot three 200 pound freak athlete wide receiver in the garbage you know sure um sure. but i think like a lot of development needs to happen with him to be like 
more than a hitch or go ball. Like a Martavis team. Bryant type. Exactly. Right. Like, right. I think the Brashad Perryman to Martavis Bryant spectrum like is where he's at right now. But hey, what if he's one of these dudes that as he gets older in the next one, two or three years, like gets in the lab or is next to like a Stefan Diggs. And he's like, hey, man, this is how I study right. corners this is how I learn to have no wasted fat on my routes and create separation over the middle of the field. Again, this entire Jaden Daniels conversation that we had earlier kind of applies to Brian Thomas in a way because, hey, we don't have multiple breaking routes. We don't have him against press coverage. Uh, having to displace a cornerback and then work over the middle of the field, you know? Yeah. He's so good at these downfield bucket catches and and tracking the ball in that manner. But, like, after the catch, I don't know what the the numbers say exactly, but to me he went down easily. There were a couple occasions, obviously, when he breaks that or takes almost a step back and then turns the corner and outruns everyone. So, the, like, his averages might be super high, but I kind of wonder if we look at his yards after catch numbers, if a few of them would be like 25, 35, 45 and like big numbers. And then every other one would be like one, two, one, two, three, mm -hmm. one, one, one yards. Yeah. Um, yeah. It would not shock me based on his production profile last year and just speed, 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 which was very difficult to come by in for agency this offseason. If he is a, you know, top 15 pick. I think that is in the potential range of outcomes here. But yeah. again, his individual development on like the more nuances of the game would take him from being like a really good downfield playmaking role player into a legit two wide receiver. Hey, this guy's going to uh, take advantage of isolated coverage beyond just nine routes. Yeah, it's scary, man. I uh, I definitely like my model really, really likes Brian Thomas, um, but I more subjectively am like, OK, yeah, he's younger, you know, has a decent breakout score and he played alongside Malik neighbors. All that stuff is great. But then, you know, you just dig in a little bit more and you can kind of see just general issues with his profile and the contested catch rate type stuff. And um, just the, the 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 fact that we're drafting him seemingly on ceiling scares me a little bit. And I, I had this discussion with Pat Corain on his podcast last week or two weeks ago. And I, I think that, and, and I think Pat might've brought it up, so I don't want to take credit for it, but I think we get the floor ceiling idea wrong a lot of times in fantasy football. And when we're making rookie draft picks, we're going to say, Oh, we're, I'm going to take Brian Thomas because he has such a great ceiling. Whereas, you know, you might look at lad McConkey and be like, you know, McConkey has a great floor, but maybe the ceiling isn't there. Right. But I do think that there are times, many, many times where we just get the ceiling evaluation completely wrong. And maybe we should just be drafting for floor, right? Like, like what's to say that Lad McConkey in X offense can't be more productive than Brian Thomas in X offense, right? I don't, I don't, I mean, look at like Cooper cup or something, you know, these, these right. situations of these like sort of slot can probably play on the outside kind of hybrid players uh, going like a Keenan Allen or even where if they're in the right spot position, obviously, you know, a guy like Keenan Allen's and Cooper Cup, they're elite at what they do. But I think in general, we probably get this archetype of ceiling wrong, where we assume the ceiling in fantasy football, the ceiling player is the prototypical X, is the prototypical size guy who can get down the field. But I don't know if that's it, especially in today's game, right? Yeah. Especially in today's game. So I think maybe another way to frame it and tell me if I'm taking your words or misconstruing them here. I think if Brian Thomas stays who he is right now, he will be a high variance type, you know? Yeah. And yeah. maybe the ceiling comes in where that variance becomes consistency of targets and opportunities that aren't just, you know, Jalen Hyatt-esque vertical right. routes, which obviously some weeks, especially in best ball, fantastic, right? But right. like on right. a managed week-to-week -week basis can be somewhat frustrating. But like, even we go through a period of time where like Christian Watson, for example, had that stretch of exactly. hitting, 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 hitting. But then we again, it's still this high variance nature of it. Just one final point on your thoughts about ceiling and floor. I think that can be converted into quarterback evaluations, too, mm, where mm -hmm. like Anthony Richardson last year, for example, um, his ceiling was viewed as high because of his rushing ability. To me, we should almost have viewed that as the floor 
that we're right. getting. And yep. then the ceiling is the game slowing down exactly. from the passing standpoint, right? Yep. And so yep. he brings this insane skill set as a runner already as a floor. I thought that he was undervalued in terms of his pocket management, feel for pressure. His pressure sack rate was unreal. And I don't think people still will appreciate that. Yeah. But then just, you know, the reps that he would get in an actual legitimate NFL offense then just makes that ceiling even higher with the passing numbers that come on top of it. Yeah, and that's how it is in fantasy football, too. People think of rushing mobility as a ceiling for fantasy quarterbacks. Really, that's the floor. And yeah. then what really creates a ceiling is when they're good passers, too, is when you get that combination. Really quick, let's talk about the, the Texas wide receivers. You have Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Worthy. Adonai Mitchell analytically does not look great. Uh, Xavier Worthy analytically looks great. And I'm not even talking about his 40 time. Where are you at with these guys? So why does Adonai Mitchell's statistical profile not look great? Uh, I'll throw out one because it kind of goes back to exactly what we were talking about earlier. I think it was a three-star recruit coming out of, mm -hmm. of high school. He goes to Georgia, a national championship team his freshman year. And if we want to use the term earns, he earns um, <laughs> 52 targets on that right. team that has Brock Bowers, Ladd McConkey, James Jermaine Cook, Bur Jermaine Burton, Burton Darnell yeah. Washington. That's the second most on that team, right? Yeah. Um, in the college football playoff that season in the next year, which by the way, he missed the entire year because of a high ankle sprain comes back just ahead. I think it was like the Alabama contest. They like force feed him the football in those situations. I mean, to me, that is actually to statistically while the efficiency was not there, but statistically really impressive for a dude to do that his true freshman season. Yeah, I, I would say that the reason his analytical profile looks weak is because I mean, obviously you can look at things like yards per out run or because yards per out run numbers, I think actually the worst in the class, uh, his best wow. season yards per out run uh, yards per team pass attempt really, really low. And, and, but the reason I think that, you know, the, the greater point is that the consistency just hasn't been there, but that's yeah. also partially, you know, like we talked about earlier, the transfer, right. Goes to, new, to Texas from Georgia. And also he's an early declare. He only played three years in college. And right. so I do. And, and so like, there's these other non-production factors that the model's looking at, like teammate score. He obviously gets a really nice boost there. Um, and he's an early declare. He does get a slight, it's not nearly as big as probably other models, but like there's stuff like that where it's getting factored in. This is the problem though that I have. Uh, and I'm not saying that I'm going to be higher or lower than consensus on, on Mitchell. I, I do want to see how the draft kind of unfolds because he's just one of those players where I, I really want to see draft capital a lot. But right now he's getting first round love. Okay. Yeah. He has a 42 ish breakout score, which is out of a hundred. So it's, you know, a below average breakout score. I'll just read the wide receivers who are drafted in round one since 2011, who had a breakout score below 60. So this is well Even below. Higher, right. Yeah, right, right. He's well below this number. Cordero Patterson, Tavon Austin, Kelvin Benjamin, Kevin White, Philip Dorsett, Josh Doxson, Henry Ruggs, Jalen Rager, Kadarius Tony. Yeah, that's it. There just yeah. hasn't been a hit from this profile. Right. I'm not saying and that there th that, that be, is, but that is production that actually happened versus the opportunity of getting the 52 targets. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It's, it's the actual, what did he end up doing? It's, it's really based on, I mean, it's based on yards per team pass attempt. Right. And it's, right. it's, it's number one, it's prorated for games played. And then it's also adjusted for program that, that he played at. So technically his Georgia numbers are getting boosted way more than, right. you know, uh, any, uh, almost any other program. And then even Texas gets, a, you know, it's fine. It's not, it's not like a negative weight or anything like that. And so, my thing with Mitchell is more so, you know, I sort of approach scouting with numbers by this, this prospect is perfect right now. Let me find the red flags. Let me, let me Got drill it. into this guy and just see where things are wrong. And you can look at Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze, and you can find some things, but not many. And are you kind things. of doing the opposite here? And I, I well, I'm In looking at AD like Mitchell. The, the model spits him out as not great, but then you're looking for positives. In a way, in a way, I am I am trying to find the silver lining with a lot of this stuff with AD Mitchell. Yes. Right. And I I think I think there are things. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, like again, there's a chance. So I have this thing called draft capital delta, which compares a player's prospect score to where he was drafted, and it finds the difference, see who's overrated and underrated. And it does that by sort of uh, attributing a low risk, high risk, or neutral risk uh to his profile, this tag, right? There's a chance he's even a neutral wide receiver despite all of these things because 
he had, you know, he only played for three years in college. His, uh, you know, he had the, the teammate stuff going on in his favor and uh, maybe he doesn't get drafted. Obviously, if his if his draft capital is lower than what's expected right now, there's a better chance that he would then be a neutral type player. He wouldn't be a high risk type player because the higher you go, the higher the expectation. And so um, I just think there's a lot of red flags with Mitchell right now. And I, I let me ask you this. Do yeah, you yeah. think that that Mitchell would be even close to this kind of draft capital projection if not for the combine? Let's say he goes 25th overall. I don't even know who's yeah. drafting 25th overall. Let's say he goes 25th overall, but he would have gone like do you, like like 40th overall pre comp. Like do you, do you, do you think that it's because the combine that he would be a first round pick, or do you think that people would have gotten here regardless? Yeah, I don't. I'm I am not the right person to answer that question because I literally had no opinion of him prior to I got the combine. You. Yeah, yeah. But like, you know, big and fast. When a 6'2, 205 <laughs> pound guy has a 98th percentile broad jump, 89th right. percentile vertical jump, 94th percentile vertical, 76th percentile 10 yard. Not bad, right? Yeah, not and bad. again, I go back to like that was a national championship Georgia team that was awesome on defense. Now, what I was trying to do on, on the second screen was find um, like screens, you know, because yeah. I think screens are kind of the easy button in college football for production. Like we see yeah, that was Xavier sure. Worthy, you know? Yes, yes. And I'm assuming since, and my brain, and you can correct me, since Xavier Worthy had a bunch of those, I'm sure Adonai Mitchell like did not. Like that was yeah. not a, a big part of his game. Um, right. And then there's, from like a pure film watching standpoint, there's even questions that aren't covered in what you're talking about now, where there are moments where he like shuts down to 70% on his routes. He's even admitted to this saying that the reason I don't go full speed on all of them is because I want to run routes for the entire drive. Um, I'm sure the Kansas City Chiefs loved hearing that uh, with all the Kadarius Tony stuff and so so forth and so on. but man, the body control, and this is like such a scouting jargon thing, but the yeah. body control that he does play with and to adjust to passes is tantalizing. And yeah. it's just like, it's uncommon. It is honestly CD lamb esque when you think of off frame, throw my back shoulder, go up and get it or mm-hmm. outstretched hands. Like my body's moving this way. I'm going to change it to this way and pluck this ball out of the air. With that said, obviously, C.D. Lamb had an amazing yards right. after catch profile at Oklahoma. Right. I think uh, Adonai Mitchell's yards after catch numbers are pitiful in comparison. Right. So there are tons of flaws there. I just do not see many prospects moving in the way that he does. And I am always going to gravitate to that with the understanding of, hey, if he fails, it's for all these reasons that JJ spoke about in this hour and 15 minute show or that Hayden's going to throw in my face and (laughs) so on and so forth. But I am lucky that that is basically only impacting my dynasty fantasy teams and opinions that I put out there on podcasts and not an NFL roster, you know? Right, right, right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so do you have Mitchell ahead of worthy? Like, do you like him more than worthy as a prospect? I think I'm going to have Adonai Mitchell as my wide receiver four in this. Are you ahead of Brian Thomas? I think so. And, and, Wow, look at you, man. So uh, do you have any any size concerns with Worthy? I honestly have not fully watched David Worthy yet. Okay, okay. And I know that his production profile is fascinating in comparison. It is. To, it's crazy. To his size. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, look, just as last year when we were talking about all these top guys and not even JSN, but like Zay Flowers and Jordan Addison, for example. And then we saw what Tank Dell did too. And right. we're like, oh, this is the new wave of wide receivers. They can be... 186 pounds or 179 pounds. Okay. Then we get to 2024 draft and we get a whole bunch of freakazoids back in the NFL. <laughs> right, you know, right, it was right. kind of that back to back second round where one year we got DK Metcalf and AJ Brown. And then the next year, <clears throat> the Rams take 2 2 Atwell and right. the Seahawks take D Eskridge. You know, it's just right. like whatever your draft gives you. And I will, I just think someone of his size typically doesn't move like that. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. And he is not going to be like a huge yards after catch burner and all that stuff. But um, yeah, I just, I really like Adonai Mitchell and the transfer thing. I I tried to dig into this a little bit just from my blurbing days back at Roto world. Apparently he had a two-year-old daughter who's two hours outside of Texas 
wasn't able to see her at all at Georgia. And so that was a huge reason for him mm. moving back is again, now with NIL and all these things, he's able to go be around her and visit her way more often than he obviously yeah. would have being on Georgia's campus. Yeah. Uh, Keon Coleman, he's another transfer. He had a fascinating out, profile outperformed. I know I want to like, I'm like, man, we're talking a while, but like these guys, I got to get your opinion on three more guys, including Keon Coleman. So Keon Coleman outproduces Jaden Reed at Michigan state. Like, I don't, I don't think we can like just push that aside. Right. Like, right. I think that's something goes down to Florida state, uh, has kind of a, whatever type. I mean, look, circus catches for sure from Keon Coleman, uh, but his production profile wasn't that great. I can, I can throw out some stuff just to, to give you an idea. Yeah, it's like of, his EPA per route or per play. And then obviously yards per route run, like all of it is kind of, it's not great. So he has a best season yards per team pass attempt. That's below two. Okay. He also has a breakout score that's below 60. So he's another one of those like AD Mitchell, you know, that grouping. Um, but his best season yards per team pass attempt was below two since 2011. Only two of 17 top 100 picks with a sub two number in that category scored 10 or more PPR points in one of their first three seasons. That was Terry McLaurin, who really beat the odds from a production profile standpoint. And then Nico Collins was the other one who, you know, you could probably put in like a similar ish archetype as like a, a Keon Coleman, but only two of 17, right? That's a 12% rate. When you look at top 100 picks who did get to a two yards per team pass attempt rate, which is many of them. Uh, that goes from 12, a 12% rate of hitting 10 or more PPR points per game in one of their first three years to a 52% rate. So it's not everything. It's just Keon Coleman's overall profile has flags, has, yeah. has a lot of flags. I would argue there are more flags with his profile than A.D. Mitchell's profile because A.D. Mitchell has sort of these like, you know, tertiary things going on from like a situation standpoint that favor him a little bit more, in my opinion. Like you look at like Johnny Wilson, he he outproduced Keon, like he had a better like a yards per team pass attempt than Keon Coleman. And it's like, like, what are we like? What's going on? Like, is, is Johnny Wilson that good or is like what's going on here? Because I think that most people would say Johnny Wilson should play tight end at the next level. Right. And so there's just a lot of of, of red flags with profile. And I don't, I'm, I'm very curious to to hear where you're at. No, I'm and even like from an athletic testing standpoint. Right. Like if you yes. just talk about. Yeah just point blank 40 time because in many ways that's how the combine is conveyed to the people out there you know that's in like the lacron treadwell devin funchess alden tate territory for someone yeah. of that size who's playing outside wide receiver um but then and when we open this conversation with just way more tools and information now gps tracking on yeah. top of it we finally get that this year i will say with gps stuff like the reason to me why the combine is so significant is again being able to compare athletic profiles via composite scores, which I want to add weight should be heavily added. People love RAS out there. And I, I don't mm -hmm. think it's a bad directional thing, but to me, it doesn't factor in weight enough yes. because think about like, okay, Xavier worthy versus Xavier Leggett. We're talking about wide receivers. Yeah. You got a 56 pounds difference. Right. You know? Exactly. And right. that's what makes wide receivers so much fun. Like think about even, running a 40 with two 10 pound dumbbells in each hand, you know, <laughs> right. like how much slower are you going to, you know, it's not, right, it's right. not, well, not only comparison. that, not only that, but, but guys are manipulating their bodies for the 40 right. time at the combine. Like I, Xavier worthy might play 10 pounds heavier than what he was at the combine, but he knew that even if he, if he weighed in 175 or 165, it didn't matter. Like they were going right. to say, you're a small wide receiver. So you might as well just aim for the freaking you know, 40 record whenever you're going there, right? So we have 40, we have 10, we have the jumps, we have the agilities, all that stuff, even though no one's ever doing the agilities anymore. And anyways, that allows us to compare these guys athletically over decades, decades, yeah. literally. Um, now with GPS, it's like the last three years. Yeah. Um, so the, the sample size is much smaller, but obviously with him being the fastest in the gauntlet at GPS allows for, you know, Oh, I love him. And then boom, directionally. Look, he runs fast in a straight line here. Um, his contested catch stuff is fascinating to go back and watch last season at FSU because, I mean, it was abysmal, right? It was like, oh, like 33 percentile over, like, I think yeah. he had, no one had more contested catch opportunities and he only converted like 10 of 30. Um, yeah. A major part of that was in the second, third, and fourth games of the season. 
he had 10 contested catch opportunities and only caught one of them. Mm. Uh, one of them. And that was against Clemson. And so that kind of derailed his entire season and all those metrics. There were actually a lot of, I thought, contested catch opportunities he should have won at the start of last season and did not. But then when they got to the back half of the season, especially when their quarterback went down, he was the dude. And when you like go and dig into his weird profile, you see that he had 20 screen targets at his size when no other wide receiver on that team had five. Again, he's what, 6'3 and 200 something pounds. Yeah. How often do you see that guy being force fed screen targets? And they yeah. were abysmal. Like he was 131st in the country and yards per reception on screens and only forced two missed tackles on those 20 attempts. Right. That, yeah. That's rough stuff. He's also a punt returner. So it kind of just, spe it speaks to, he had 25 punt returns last year. I, I wish I knew, I wish I knew a lot about that team, like, like the depth of it, because right. my, my first inclination is like, he's oddly the, the smallest of their two main wide receivers that they were using there. Right. So, so that exactly gets to the point where he was their playmaker. And so yeah. they had to force feed him these situations where they probably shouldn't have. And they were very reliant on him. And so it kind of put him in these weird and awkward situations. And that also extends to in the back half of last year, when let's say the primary or the secondary read was, was gone for the quarterback. The answer was, let's just throw it up to Keon Coleman and hope yeah. he makes a miraculous play. <laughs> and right. so again, those opportunities are opportunities, but they're not advantageous ones. Yeah. And just quickly on his, like, I would say he's probably best at creating separation early in his routes rather than like those second and third movements down the field, elongated plays. And then he does have to win those situations that he failed to in the first half of last season in order to be successful with the NFL. But in terms of like body control and body movement, he is not like a Calvin Benjamin, I think, or like mm -hmm. a Laquan Treadwell. Like, I think he just carries his weight and change of direction a lot better than those guys have. Yeah. At first, he had some really bad comps and then stuff adjusted in the model. And, and one of the guys that popped up was Cortland Sutton for, for Keon yeah. Coleman. And I actually thought that that made sense after watching him a little bit. And I was like, yeah, I could see, um, you know, the comparison there. Are, are you uh, are you Keon Coleman over Brian Thomas? No. OK, OK. Just curious no. how high. Okay. So we know we generally are you Lad McConkey over Keon Coleman right now? Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I might, let's let's my, talk about Lad. My, my conversation is Lad McConkey versus Brian Thomas, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, no, I, I have I have Lad right now. Well, I technically have Worthy after Brian Thomas. So I have Lad at wide receiver six right now. Yeah. Uh, in this class. I, I think that the weird thing with him and his production profile is he had a horrible yards per so yards per team pass attempt correlates pretty strongly to yards per out run, right? He has an unbelievably bad yards per team pass attempt number, but his yards per route run is out of control. And it's because he He's ran the, the class, right? He, he ran the fifth most routes at Georgia this past year. And yeah. so when you're not running and whether it's injury, cause I know he's banged up a little bit throughout the year, Georgia, obviously being ahead in games, so they're not going to use, you know, their studs necessarily. Um, so there's a lot of like reason for that. And so I'm right. I'm leaning into those reasons because I think it's logical to to lean in on those. What did you see with McConkey? Like, do you think that he? You know, I know we we touched on this briefly, but do you think that he could have still a decent? Because I think a lot of people would look at him and be like, oh, he's a high floor slot guy. Yes. Uh, but I think that there's probably a little bit more there than just. Yeah, that. I mean, I I think his ceiling is better than people perceive it to be because again, skin tone, they look at it, and yeah. then the comparisons are to like, you know. Edelman or Cooper Cup and like, hey, from a production standpoint, not awful. But at the same yeah. time, he he can be an outside wide receiver in the league. No doubt about it, in, in my opinion. It kind of goes back to the team construction here because Brock Bowers was basically used as like a move tight end for this mm -hmm. team. And so he got all the easy stuff. Bowers yeah. had 30 screen targets last year. Lad McConkey had just seven. OK, and 2022 both had 21 screen targets. But Bowers had 50 slot targets and Ladin McConkey had just 25. So again, yeah. Brock Bowers was basically the slot guy and the screen guy, which again is the easy button when it comes to production here. Lad yeah. kind of had to do the difficult stuff, the big boy stuff of the intermediate and downfield routes. And then when you look at it, 13 of his 30 catches this past year went for 15 plus yards. The year before that, it was 20 of 59. He dealt with an ankle sprain, came back, I believe it was against Alabama. It was obviously hurting him a little bit. So like, I, I'm a huge fan of Vlad McConkie. I think he's going to be terrible in the league when it comes to 
winning contested situations. Like it's not just his size that is different than the Brian Thomases or the Adonai Mitchells that we're talking about. I think the timing of it or like fighting through contact when like on underthrown passes or having to change his direction, not great again when it comes to going and fighting for the ball. But like if we can use the term sneaky, he's sneaky after the catch too. So I yeah. really like Lad McConkey, but I don't know if it's my simple minded brain, JJ, of, oh, I'm taking a risk here with Adonai Mitchell. Do I then want to be pretty safe here with my <laughs> ranking of Vlad McConkey and those balance each other out? Yeah, yeah. No, I feel I, I I see the same things, though. And I, I think that, you know, if your concern is contested catch stuff, I'd rather have that be a concern than sort of the opposite where a guy's good at contested catch stuff. Is that sticky then, to you? Is contested catch sticky to you? Not necessarily. I haven't tested yeah. it a ton, but like I, I don't. I care more if a guy is just bad at a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so like if like like Quentin Johnston, I think was interesting because he was so bad statistically yes. with the contested catch stuff, but yet that's what he was like supposed to do, you know, just like archetype wise and stuff. And so it was just like there's a lot of stuff not not matching up here. And so that's why the Keon Coleman thing is really interesting. But also like I I don't think that that's something that we need to really be concerned about with like a McConkey. Like it just doesn't like how many targets are going to, to come that way with a player who's a technician the way that he is, you know, so it probably just doesn't matter that much at the end of the day. Let's, let's, let's finish this off and talk about the weirdest wide receiver profile in this class. I shouldn't say wide receiver and end it there because he might be a, a totally normal dude. Although when I listened to Xavier Leggett's interview, I was not expecting the Southern draw that. And, yeah. He, he's and, from and, your other woods basically. I, yeah. Yeah. Right. Like he's, you know, I'm in Charlotte and he, uh, I, I hear that accent all the time. I just did not realize that it was going to, come from from Leggett. Um so yeah, Xavier Leggett. Let's talk about him. He plays 5 years of college ball. Yeah. R- I, and when I say he did doesn't nothing, transfer. Is that South Carolina the right, entire South time? South Carolina the entire time. 100 I think his, his max season in yardage for the first 4 years was 176 yards receiving. And then last year just goes absolutely nuclear. Like like just an unbelievable production season and just like that's the reason why people are looking at him the way they're looking at him right now. Where are you at with Leggett? Yeah, he nearly had more returns in the previous season in 2022 than he had receptions. Um, I mean, it's it's just a crazy profile. And it's then, wild. but it, it, I think his first game this year was against North Carolina. I could be confusing that. He goes out there and dominates. He yeah. was unbelievable in right. that North Carolina game. And what's crazy is he looks like he's he's not just a vertical hit or miss high variance receiver you know mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. sometimes i think profiles can lead to that and that's why there's a blow up here you know like a new coordinator comes in a new quarterback that transfers in and boom these are moments that never hit before like jalen hyatt for example right yeah or like a diami brown or something right, like that. right yeah yeah this was like legit routes legit i'm gonna win after the catch at the same time, if we can spin age back into this, he played this year at 22. He turned 23, I believe, in January, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So a 22-year-old freak athlete, all muscle, built, beating up on, you know, maybe some smaller guys might have something to do with it. I don't know, man. I'm like kind of low-key obsessed with Xavier Leggett. Nice. It, 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 it's worrisome because I have no answer. You have no answer. Unless like you talk to him individually or talk to his coaches of, hey, why did it take until year five? Because it doesn't look like your normal year five come out of nowhere type who like just learned how to play football because the dude like knows how to play football. It's pretty stunning what he did this year. Yeah, like you don't do what he did that last season by being bad or, right. or by, you know, like, like that's the, the glaring thing for me. I'll say this about him. His, his statistical comps were pretty bad. Uh, one of them was actually Jonathan Mingo, which yeah, yeah, yeah. Would that, be, uh, I'm would guilty. Be funny, would be funny. Well, it'd be funny if, if Carolina <laughs> goes that route. Cause he's been tied to the Panthers a oh, lot. Yeah, yeah. Leggett has. And so, but, but here's the thing, this is what I want to leave with, with Leggett that I think is, is pretty intriguing. And this goes back to the breakout where we're going to, we're going to uh, bring things back to the, breakout score conversation we had and sort of going against breakout age and such. Um, but Leggett had a decent, I say decent, but it was above 75, his breakout score, despite, you know, what he did the first four years. The reason for that is number one, like you said, he's a little bit younger than right. most five, like most guys would be 24 at this point. He's 23. So, you know, that's, that's one good thing. The other good thing though, is that his production last year, was just that good. And so it's weighing that in a way 
that something like breakout age would not be weighing, right? It's only looking at a binary. This looks at it as how good was that season, which is why like a Malik neighbors has a really good breakout score as well. But I'll leave you with this. It says, and this is from my prospect guide. It says, and maybe this super late breakout isn't that big of a deal since 2011. There have been just four top 100 non early declare wide receiver draft selections who were older than 23 years old when picked and who also didn't uh, who also hit a breakout score of 75 or better. And then I say to put that mouthful another way, they had an okay breakout score despite getting drafted at a fairly old age. Right. And they had good draft capital. Those four wide receivers, Sterling Shepard, Debo Samuel, Cedric Tillman and Jaden Reed. So three of the four are fantastic pros. Right. Yeah. Or Jaden you know, Reed is actually, I think, somewhat of an intriguing comparison, even though they're different sizes. sizes like they're, yeah. they're, they're built kind of differently. Yeah. But right. I could see them being used in similar ways yeah. on an NFL offense. Like obviously, Legat was a do everything dude for South Carolina this year, but how powerful and strong he was and you know, the the, the motions that we saw with Jaden Reed, some manufactured touch stuff at the line of scrimmage, and then, you know, get the ball in his hands and let him work. I I, I do think like that kind of similar vision for a player can definitely work here with Xavier like Well, what's, what's interesting too, is that two of those guys, I mean, you know, Sterling Shepard, obviously, but Sterling Shepard was a, a pretty good yak, like yeah. type slot guy who just never could really, really hit the ceiling that we thought he could because of, of health. But two of those guys in Debo and Jaden Reed both do things in sort of unconventional ways, right? Yeah. Which I think is probably why it took them a little bit longer to maybe either declare or, you know, uh, uh, produce what have you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that what we could be looking at with Leggett is the fantasy industry being fairly low on him because of the standard things that the fantasy industry looks at. And it could be an opportunity to just, you know, go against the grain and just be right. like, Hey, there's at least something there that we can point to that's to say that he's, he's not going to be as bad as you think. And just a, a quick mention of the Mingo point that you made earlier, the mention, um, with Mingo, you basically had to make excuses of even like his final season or the year before, like why yeah. the statistical profile just didn't work out. Hey, at least we have one blow up season from yeah. Xavier. Again. You know, like saw it. There, there isn't even close that Mingo did anything production wise in comparison to what Xavier would get did this year. Yeah. I mean, again, it's not just the profiles that are fascinating or the ages that are fascinating. It's also, again, having to rank Xavier worthy next to Xavier Leggett when the dudes are 56 pound difference <laughs> yeah. and and have the same WR in their chest at the combine and the same checklist or however you want to do it. I mean, it, it's just to me what makes the wide receiver position so much fun in comparison to everything else. Um, 100%. Because they're, they won't be asked to do the same things, but they're drafted the same exact position. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's by far the most fun position for fantasy analysts in particular. And then I, I, I really do think like even freaking tank Dell changes my perspective on this this year yeah. because I've even seen this year during free agency, people saying that like the Texans should go out and get like T Higgins or so on and so forth. And like, Oh, just plug, Tank Dell into the slot. The dude is an awesome outside wide receiver. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. I don't want to move him. I don't want to do anything. I want him to like keep corners on their heels and the way he's just able to break off and play bigger than his size too. Like Tank Dell is despite hundred and whatever pounds, not a slot wide receiver to me is an outside playmaker. Yeah. I think people have to be open-minded about that too. Whenever they're evaluating these guys from college to pros, because it's really easy, you know, like you look at Tank Dell's profile and even last year in my in my prospect guide, like I was like, yeah, he's probably going to play slot in the NFL, right? Like that was that was what I thought was going to happen. But uh, I thought the same thing for like an Elijah Moore and Elijah Moore goes out and year one dominates the perimeter, right? It's just that his teams have not been using him that way. I think that he should be used that way more, or at least ro- like more of a rotation uh, with a guy like Moore. But I think we need to just at least be open minded to these possibilities that a guy who was either small or stapled to the slot throughout right. college be open minded to the fact that a team might want to use him in a different way. And like with the Texans, for example, versus let's say what the Jets were doing previously with Elijah Moore. I mean, so many of Tank Dell's big plays this year happened again off under center, marrying the run to the pass, deep play action basically two vertical routes because what yeah. Bobby Sloak did so well this year was keep one or two or even three extra protection, extra blockers in to allow Nico Collins, big fast dude, tank Dell, 
super mover, right? That yeah, it's, yeah. it's tough to stick with on three, three and a half yards on the field. And then boom, we get these explosive plays. Yeah. When Amari Cooper went down for Kevin Stefanski this year, Elijah Moore steps in there for like that one game with Joe Flacco. Joe, and yeah. it's, it's under center, Rams, deep play action. Yeah. Hey, we're going to make these things happen down the field. So again, it, it comes to the fit where, oh, if it's just, let's say like the opposite of that, which is Joe Burrow, 98% shotgun. Mm -hmm. I'm going to catch it and throw it quickly, right? Tank Dell might not be as good as he is with, again, these right. big, deep shot vertical routes off play action. But right. the fit where he is right now, I definitely want to keep him on the outside. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Josh, I could talk to you for hours, man. Like literally, I mean, I, I well, this is no, again, three years, three years been waiting for this one. And we only got a hundred or one hour and 38 minutes in. Let's put it that I way. I know. I know. We got to just do six more of these and then we'll, we'll, we'll if, catch up. Hey, on the if the people who listen to this want more JJ and Josh shows, let us know because, uh, now it's a possibility. Now it's a possibility for sure. Uh, let everyone know where they can find you. Just go on YouTube. That's where I live now. It's all I think about at this point. Uh, it's currently called the Underdog NFL Draft YouTube channel. We will change it after the draft to back to Underdog Fantasy Football most likely. But uh, we have been churning out content. We will do that through the NFL Draft. And obviously, as soon as that turns... Um, New Best Ball Mania opens. And yes, so immediately after the draft, we'll talk about where all these guys fit. New rankings for every single position. And uh, it never stops. It never stops. But I'm, I really am enjoying the the YouTube life aspect of it all. And we appreciate you all um, tuning in and watching and uh, supporting both of us. Yeah, absolutely. You guys are crushing it over on YouTube. Really awesome job, both you and Hayden. Uh, I am on Twitter at LateRoundQB. You can find prospect guide, all the stuff I'm offering over on late round.com. Otherwise, everyone, thank you for tuning in.